So my name is Frank Chepkema, I come from Holland. And uh, Chepkema means son of Chep, which is a typical Frisian name from the north of Holland. Uh, and Chepkema is a, it's a difficult name when you're a designer and you want to communicate with the world. And after the third meeting, uh, the client still doesn't know your name. Uh, so I decided to make a change, um, to change the name from Chepkema Studio, which it was before to Chep. Uh, and it was also a nice way to show that we actually represent a team of uh, people. Uh, my agency has, uh, we averagely uh, work with, uh, with about five people, and the core is actually only uh, three people. Um, so I just want to place uh, things in context. Uh, uh, Netherlands is about as different as you can get from uh, Africa as is about possible. Uh, so I want to show you some images of uh, the Netherlands. Uh, this is a sky view of a city called Almere. And actually everything you see here is not l much older than 50 years, uh, because it's actually man-made land. Uh, Holland is uh, so incredibly crowded uh, that we have to gain land on the sea. Um, so that's an interesting place, because everything, everything is designed, everything is man-made. Uh, this is, uh, I'm zooming in a little bit in uh, Almere, and a typical uh, uh, neighborhood in Almere uh, would look like this if you uh, walk through it. Um, it's, it's, it's a very good one in the sense that it's very extreme, uh, and it has a sort of beauty in, the, in, in its extremism. Uh, but of course, it's not very uh, human. You miss a sort of soul, you, you miss something. Uh, and it's 100% designed. Um, a forest in Almere would look like this. <laughs> um, and this is where it really starts to go wrong, uh, if, if we sort of impose on, upon nature our sort of uh, very rational and very uh, theoretic, theoretical way of, of, of uh, arranging space. Um, this is a forest like it may, should be, as it should be, I guess. Uh, this is uh, in the garden route. And I was lucky enough to travel through Africa for a week. This is one of the landscapes we crossed. It's called Swartberg. Um, and as we arrived at the top of Swartberg, it says the top, uh, we arrived near a place uh, called the Hell. And uh, we, were, uh, we had no idea what to expect uh, of a place called the Hell in such a, a wonderful natural environment. Uh, but the hell is located somewhere here uh, in this really sort of absolutely amazing landscape. Um, and then we read a little bit about the hell, and the hell is a, is a remote farmer's uh, community uh, that lived for centuries totally uh, uh, separated from, uh, uh, from the rest of the world. There was no road going to the hell. Um, and this is pure speculation, but we think that they called it the hell just to keep people out of there. It was probably the Hamel, it must have been a total paradise. Uh, and the proof for this is actually that in the 60s uh, they built a road to uh, the hell. Uh, and when they built the road, not, not only a lot of people came in, but all the farms left. And there's only one uh, farmer that is still living there. In Holland, we are having amazing ab ideas about farms uh, that look like this. Uh, this is a, a sort of hyper-functional uh, farm. It's a, a vertical farm. Uh, all the processes are integrated. It's fantastic. Uh, the animals are on the ground floor, and the warmth of the animals go through the greenhouses. Uh, the, the, the excrements of the animals are transformed into energy that is used to light up the, the, the greenhouses. Um, actually, the Animals get more space in one of these than they get in a, in a traditional farm. Uh, so it's very uh, a sort of dualistic uh, problem here, uh, because emotionally this is a big problem for uh, people in Holland also. Um, actually, you can imagine that these will be uh, our only mountains uh, soon, <laughs> if, this, if this continues. Um, but self-sufficiency and uh, that village in, uh, in Africa called the Hell uh, is a, a, a sort of theme that is uh, fascinating me right now. And I asked uh, one of our interns to sort of uh, investigate how much space you would need to have 100 people get uh, three meals a day in a totally uh, self-sufficient environment. 
and making a few calculations, checking them with uh, the U University of Agriculture in uh, Holland, but not going too much into details. We came uh, to this uh, superficie of uh, 480 meters diameter to keep 100 people alive. Um, and even if you use uh, greenhouses, you could actually reduce it to 400 meters in a sort of uh, horizontal arrangement. Uh, this is a theoretical design for a farm uh, where you actually see uh, the, the greenhouse in the middle, uh, uh, um, something to provide energy, and a little restaurant on top where the people can actually eat. Um, going further on this model, uh, you can imagine adding some, a few houses so the people can actually uh, live there. Um, and if you would repeat this idea in Holland, um, you would need 400 by 400 meters. Uh, uh, we have 16 million people right now, but if you divide that space, or the space we have in Holland by the 400 by 400, uh, uh, we actually, the conclusion is that we could have uh, almost 26 million people in Holland uh, based on this model. Uh, right now we're at about 17. Um, the interesting thing here is that uh, it's uh, a pretty radical idea because it uh, makes it possible to eliminate, eliminate transportation uh, and that's uh, the pollution that uh, comes with that. So the next phase in the project uh, was to make it self-sufficient but fun. Um, and I looked at, uh, I've always wanted to design a, a, a theme park and I haven't had the assignment yet. Uh, so I came into the idea within this project to, to design a theme park um, that is a farm, a restaurant, a, f uh, a kitchen, a sort of integration of all these things. Um, and I th this is a picture I made in Normandy in, in France. And I like this sort of arrangement of things, a sort of superposition of existing elements, uh, creating a, a, a beautiful building, very poetical, uh, very sensitive. This is the first sketch for the, for the theme park. A the theme park needs a ride, so there's a ride in there. Um, and I'm actually going to take you through the elements. Uh, so we have a windmill. The context is Holland, so I'd like to sort of use uh, the icons of Holland. We need fields, we need animals, we need a tree, we need some wheels, we need cables, we need cabins for the ride, uh, we need greenhouses, we need silos, we need a barn that looks like a barn. We need a biogas insulation connected to the barn so that the excrements of the animals are turned into energy to, to feed the, cons, uh, the complex of energy. Uh, we need the normal toilets that are also connected to the biogas system. Uh, this will be the first restaurant in the world where you actually are paid to uh, do a shit. We have uh, CO2 recycling, so the, the compound has to be uh, totally uh, closed. Uh, the CO2 of the animals is filtered through the greenhouses. We have a hotel, because we're not going to charge here. I mean, there's no money here. So uh, actually, the guests are also the farmers. They get to work there while they stay. We have a kitchen, and we have a slaughterhouse. And that integration is sort of uh, interesting, because we're not used to uh, eating next to the place where the animals are killed. But that's part of the theme park, that's the interesting part. Uh, so we have a water well for the water, we have a fishing pond, uh, we have a ticket booth, we have more fields around the place, and we have guests. Uh, and the project is called Oogst, which means harvest in Dutch, quite a nice word.
So that's uh, August 2. And really the question and the purpose of uh, this project uh, I have found in Africa actually, is it is the hell or the Hamo? Um, and uh, I think I'm going to work on the third version and maybe a fourth version until the concept is like perfect. So I think self-determination is a, is a sort of uh, really important concept uh, in order to keep things human and with a soul, to avoid this sort of things. Um, and we came across a lot of these houses, of course, in Africa, and they represent uh, social injustice. But for me as a designer, I found a, a lot of beauty in them often, and especially this one, uh, which is actually made of doors. And how, how, how beautiful is that metaphor, to have a house that is made of doors? And the person who made uh, this house actually used metal or something to, to, to create a sort of a door impression on the door he had. Um, so there's a lot of effort in this. It also reminded me of uh, one of the Dutch design icons, uh, this one. Um, and it's uh, what uh, Dutch design has been a lot about. It's using uh, nostalgia, reusing materials. Uh, this is a house in Portugal, and it's the same thing. It's, a, it's an absolutely beautiful house. It says something about the inhabitants. Uh, and uh, when you compare it to the Dutch situation, the contrast is, uh, is totally amazing. Um, this is the first, my mission actually, uh, uh, part of my mission is to see if I can, as an industrial designer, um, get closer to the uh, right side of the image than to the uh, left side of the image that you just saw, saw. Um, but we're still within the industrial context. So this is a, a vase that is uh, actually based on your signature. You give us your signature and we transform it into a product. Um, now, it's, it's a pretty common thing uh, known among, among designers that when you don't know what to do with a shape, it's either a vase or a lamp. Uh, so sorry for the colleagues, but I've given that one away. Uh, this is uh, also a sort of uh, intervention we, saw in, we see a lot in, in urban situations. Uh, and graffiti, is, I mean, a lot of, of, uh, of spaces we know just deserve graffiti. And you have good graffiti and, and bad graffiti. Um, but especially this, this one on the right, which is by Bansky, is, a, is really beautiful because it's a graffiti artist that is actually uh, covering graffiti uh, with graffiti and a very delicate, in a very de delicate, sensible way. Uh, I just want to go back in time a little bit. This is uh, me uh, when I was about six or seven. Uh, and you may think this is an average Dutch uh, farmhouse or something, but actually this is the 18th floor of our apartment in New York. And uh, I guess I'm figuring out if what I just made is a vase or a lamp or a hat. <laughs> it's the first evidence of uh, design. Um, but uh, as you heard before, I was uh, drawing a lot of rockets and uh, uh, it astounded me actually that I always made them sort of self-sufficient. Uh, integrating a toilet in it. <laughs> so the hobby is, 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 is old. Uh, this is a bicycle I drew in that period, and it's a, it's a solar-powered uh, bicycle. And I was also luckily, lucky enough to have made my first vase without knowing it in that time, because I used the, the signature I made on one of my first drawings uh, to make a new vase recently. 1998 was an important year because uh, when I was 18 I really had to make a choice between music and industrial design and uh, these were my two heroes. On the left side we have Giorgetto Giugiaro which is a car designer and uh, industrial design at that time really looked like this. It was really functionalistic, it was technical and this was what I aspired to from my drawing work and uh, 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 sort of passion in there but at the same time I was heavily into uh, music and in jazz music, and I spilled, even played in reggae bands. Um, and to make a choice there was sort of difficult. I went to a concert in that year of, of Archie Chep, uh, and I only recently discovered actually that uh, all the, the things that you hear in jazz music uh, are things that I'm trying to push into industrial design. So. Uh, a sense of improvisation, uh, a sort of intuitiveness, uh, those sort of, of words are, are important to me. 
So when I was asked to design the house of the future for the architectural institute in, in uh, uh, Rotterdam, I had already seen uh, those, I already had seen these houses in, in, in Portugal that I showed, and I wanted to make a house that would uh, um, have the qualities that I wanted, uh, but still within an industrial context. So I'm actually a, a pretty bad craftsman. Everything I do, I have to do uh, through the computer, and this, everything I do is uh, uh, actually made by machine, almost everything. Um, but I, I do want to have that sensitivity in, the, in what I do. So this is the interior of that house. And what I did, I took layers that I actually sampled from all sorts of places, but that are relevant in the house. So you see uh, uh, um, yeah, stones, you see graffiti, you see uh, rugs, you see wood, you see all, all the materials, you see electrical systems, you see uh, wallpaper, but everything uh, superposed and, la and layered. And this was actually a, a starting point for a new project, an attempt to do this uh, in scale one-on-one, -on -one, a commission from Droog Design, the chair of textures. Um, and this was pretty difficult because uh, uh, the step from that uh, nice little model that was uh, more close to my jewelry work that I will show later um, towards the one-on-one -on -one was, was, was problematic. I'm, I haven't solved it uh, totally yet. Uh, uh, it becomes too mechanical. It becomes, uh, you have, to, you have to, to deal with the weight and with the, with the structure. And uh, we got out of it, but, but it, it wasn't exactly uh, as, as fine as I wanted it to be. This was a request from an architectural agency in Rotterdam called Hostad. They invited designers to think about the skin of buildings. And I was dealing with layers and I was thinking, well, wouldn't it be fantastic to have a sort of Scottish uh, pattern on buildings that would actually change as the, the functions within the buildings change. So as people move, you would actually see the advertising changing. You would see layers of, of green, of, of information, everything going through each other and buildings would not be as anonymous as we, as we know them. Uh, layers is uh, an important uh, theme in my work. Uh, we, were, we live in a very complex word, world to diffuse, uh, especially in the urban context. A lot of brands, a lot of signals, and um, I wanted to compress all those brand images into one object, uh, which is called the Bling Bling, designed in 2003, I think. 2002, um, and actually uh, sort of getting rid of the whole branding thing in one object. Like you buy this object and you don't have to worry about any brands anymore. Because <laughs> you can actually just wear it and uh, you're, you're branded for life. <laughs> uh, this is the technical drawing of the, that product. So actually we, we, what I like about it also is that it looks very fine and, 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 and uh, Handmade and uh, uh, actually, it's 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 totally industrial. It's uh, it, it really the, the 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 components come into the office and it takes really five minutes to to mount it, making it a pretty commercial success actually, uh, as compared to the the vase of tech, uh, the vase I showed before that is much too expensive to make. So if we uh, are talking about new religions being brands and having this new uh, sort of symbol uh, in the shape of a Christian cross. Uh, any an analogy of t to Africa is, is absolutely coincidental, because I had that comment that it looks like Africa, but it's, it's absolutely not my intention. Um, but um, if we have sort of the new religion, we also uh, this new sort of uh, piece of jewelry, we also need a new church that goes with it. Uh, so I made a proposal for a sort of uh, ultimate uh, shopping mall. This is a picture I took uh, in Italy. It's the, it's the wall underneath the, the balcony of Romeo and Juliet in Verona. And here, uh, this is an example of beautiful graffiti, the, the layering, the, it's, it's thousands and thousands of love declarations superimposed. Um, and I thought, would it, wouldn't it be nice to have that sort of layering, that sort of uh, uh, depth in a piece of jewelry? So this is a, a brooch. It's eight centimeters big, and it has the word love repeated in as many fonts as I could find. And again, the detail. Uh, this was a commission to design a, a crown for uh, Princess Maxima and the future king 
uh, Willem Alexander, and I wrote their names in all the fonts I could find to celebrate their love, and the points on the eye are the diamonds. And it wasn't actually uh, worn by the princess, but it was part of an exhibition in, in, during the marriage uh, in the town hall. And I really loved this, this picture, because it sort of uh, shows sort of ultimate uh, object of desire. <laughs> Break. Um, I like to try to find ways to, f to change the negative into positive. Um, Marcel told about the baby face fixation yesterday. Um, I tackled the, the concept of breaking things, uh, uh, porcelain. Um, and this is the do break I designed for droop design. And it's the first vase in the history of vases uh, that is actually meant to be broken. It's the ideal present for any marriage. And you see how, uh, how actually when it's broken, there's a layer of rubber on the inside that keeps the parts together. Um, following this, a follow-up on that project was uh, the Shockproof collection. And I would like to show you a little movie about that collection. Don't drop it. <laughs> so actually, uh, yeah, within seconds we had this sort of uh, a new archaeology, like uh, as if somebody had been gluing them toge together for ages. Well, we have a concept like that about breaking. How do you transpose that to jewelry? Well, that was an easy one. The heartbreak. <laughs> uh, to reveal things is an important theme. This, I'm going to show you some work from my uh, study time. Uh, and often in old buildings you sort of see the structure, the way things work, and in new buildings they tend to disappear behind the systems. And uh, uh, This is a lamp actually that sh just shows how the connections are made within the lamp, within a sort of uh, transparent structure, a very simple idea. Nostalgia is an important theme. Um, this is a project I did at school uh, where the commission was to uh, design a drilling machine. Uh, and uh, drilling machines uh, often look like uh, laser guns for some reason. Uh, so I tried to find a, a metaphor that's radically uh, distant from, from this sort of imagery we are used to, um, but still very familiar and very uh, uh, sensitive and, and close to us. So I looked uh, into uh, uh, where we come from in Holland and uh, the milling and the woodwork that are involved in that. And uh, drilling a hole is something very simple. You don't need a laser for that. You can use something very archaic. Uh, and I came up with, uh, after a few studies, with, with this product, uh, which can hold a, a, a motor as any other drill can. It can be just as functional, but it looks radically different. And I still like it to use it as a reference in, in my presentations. The ultimate everything. Now, we haven't found the material yet that can achieve this. Something that uh, grows, that uh, changes, uh, that adapts to, uh, to, uh, uh, 
to your need instantly. And this is actually a product that is uh, a furniture, it's a blanket, it's a chair, uh, it's a, whatever you want it to be. Artificial. Uh, this was a picture I took as a starting point for my graduation project in 96. And this was a flower shop in Holland where they had tropical plants, but because the tropical plants don't uh, get flowers in our climate, they had to put plastic uh, flowers onto them to make it look like they could uh, get flowers. So uh, in this design I tried to turn the situation around, finding that slightly more respectful towards nature. So this is the first artificial tree that has real flowers. And uh, no, no cloning. Uh, another product was uh, this artificial plant. Um, you saw the way we plant trees. Uh, so if we, do, if we plant trees in a sort of arith arithmetical way, why should uh, uh, artificial plants not look uh, arithmetical? So I, I took a, a leaf and really planted exactly the same way on the, on the rubber uh, structure. The rubber makes it very dynamic. It makes it uh, possible to change the shape every day. And this was an artificial plant that was radically different from the artificial plants at that time. And a third observation was that you don't give a plastic uh, rose to your girlfriend. Um, so I wondered why actually, and I found a way to come around that was to uh, uh, dismantle the flower and repackaging it, and then you can give it as a sort of construction set, and it makes it fun again. You can you can build your own little flower. So we had actually uh, really I think 20,000 uh, flowers come from China. Uh, we ordered them dismantled, but uh, they just uh, flew them in all finished. <laughs> So we actually had to uh, dismantle them again and before we could package them then in, uh, in Holland. It was crazy. This is a, a, a nest, the technical drawing for a nest. And this is how we figured out we could uh, get two branches out of one sheet in the most efficient possible way. And we had that cut out of uh, three centimeters thick rubber. And that uh, made this object. Uh, we were under incredible time pressure uh, two weeks before the Salone to, to have something finished. And actually this, this concept also came out of a sort of need to have something made really fast without involvement of uh, any making or handcrafts or anything. Uh, so the machine had these made in, in, in two days and we had this object uh, that had became quite an important icon for our studio. It's the nest. Uh, but we didn't figure out how to... Uh, <laughs> We still had a transportation problem, so we had to rent a bigger bus. Air conditioning. Uh, this was a commission from uh, uh, British Airways uh, to design air conditioning. Quite unusual commission. Um, this is the result. Uh, and uh, what we came up with was actually the air conditioning uh, provides us with oxygen, like a tree would uh, provide us with oxygen. Uh, at the same time, we're in an extremely uh, uh, high-tech environment, so we took real branches and sort of made uh, computer manipulations on them, uh, mimicking sort of radar movement that you see uh, on the airports. Um, and at the same time, we found out that doing that, we sort of discovered uh, the imagery of broken porcelain, which was also very nice for a restaurant situation, a, a lounge situation. Um, and uh, it was really a visual study, it's not anything technical, um, but it, uh, it made this, this sort of sculptural object and uh, what was very innovative about this was that uh, for the first time an air conditioning was not sort of uh, put behind the walls but made the central focus point of, uh, of a space. And this is the result. And also it had a sort of metaphor of, of a tornado. So on, on suddenly on, on all sorts of levels it, it uh, appealed to us as, a, as an interesting design. Uh, integration. This is a, a project I'm working on with uh, Caroline, some of you know. Uh, where, uh, it's a known in initiative and uh, it's a, a proposal for an urban garden. Uh, that usually in, in the cities you would have houses and you would have gardens. Um, and in Holland, having not made very much space, uh, and especially in Amsterdam, uh, this is a proposal to actually 
have uh, glass houses uh, with floating trees inside as a sort of uh, vertical garden. And um, uh, actually combining two Dutch icons, which are the glass houses you see everywhere, and the old uh, Dutch uh, architecture. So creating a sort of ghost houses around na nature is the, is the metaphor. And uh, this is the interior. Uh, deconstruct. This is a lamp uh, proposal for Droog design where uh, I sort of try to apply decoration in layers using a laser and actually seeing how f when um, decoration becomes uh, a destruction and see how far you can go and uh, see up to where actually destruction uh, bec becomes beauty. Um, and it uh, ended up in this object. And you see actually three different patterns of three to totally different styles that mix up uh, to create something new. Can an accident, something negative, be turned into something positive? Uh, we were commissioned to make a, 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 a conference table and the conference is actually an accident of people coming together, of ideas coming together, yet the furniture is always sort of a monolithic one thing. So uh, we made the furniture come together also as a sort of accident. A reward. This is a project uh, um, I made with my ex-girlfriend when we got a baby. Um, and instead of uh, making uh, uh, cards or something, uh, we de we're designers, we thought we had to make an object uh, to celebrate it and to tell it to the people. Um, so, as a baby uh, is born, everybody gets a new status and we gave these medals with a new status to everybody. With their, so we have the aunts, the, the grandfathers, the great-grandmothers, uh, everybody got his medal. And uh, the, the, birthday, uh, the birth card was actually a, a big poster with everybody's picture uh, with a new status on it. And this resulted in a, in a, in a product that is commercialized. And this is uh, somebody that wrote me an email just uh, two months ago uh, thanking me for this concept because she got so much attention with it and she was so pleased. And she was actually wondering if she should give one to her husband uh, because he actually was never home and she did all the work. So uh, he didn't really deserve one. Um, so we proposed her actually to make a very small one for him. Fat. Uh, Again, uh, t trying to find a social issue somewhere and transforming it into something uh, relevant for furniture. We were uh, asked to design a piece of furniture of the future, um, or a future vision of furniture. We thought, well, if people are going to get fatter, uh, maybe uh, furniture shouldn't get thinner, lighter, but get fatter as well, to avoid too much contrast. Uh, so that resulted in this object. and. Uh, it's a functional object, uh, only this chair actually needs another chair uh, in order to stand up because it's so heavy. It's about 80 kilos, so you actually have to put it on another chair. We're not always involved in... in we also like simplicity. It really depends on the, commi on the commission or uh, the client. Uh, we don't have a dogmatic approach to anything. Uh, this was a commission to make a bottle. And I had seen a few of my industrial projects just not go through because I was too ambitious, wanted too much uh, concepts, too much form or too much this and that. Uh, and with this commission I really decided, okay, this, we have to do it right, we're going to keep it super simple. And it's a, it's a bottle, a water bottle, and we took a very simple metaphor of the water impulse and translated it into a, a bottle. And, it, and this, this approach to this project was a, a real success because uh, it's now in the supermarkets in Holland. And uh, I think it's really nice to sort of be able to go into supermarkets or in galleries or not limit ourselves to things. Voice. This is a, a pro an art project for a school. Uh, we, were, we had a free brief to do something. The only uh, um, requirement was that students would remember it when they leave the school. It had to be uh, meaningful to them. So we actually made an interactive school bell. Uh, 
the, there's a microphone integrated and uh, students actually have to speak into the school bell and the school bell uh, mimics their voice or whatever they do. Uh, so they have influence on the most dictatorial thing of the school, which is the school bell that goes every uh, morning and every at the beginning of every lesson. And uh, the design is actually based on a sort of satellite shape to which you speak and it speaks back. Neighborhood, I'm going to go a little bit faster. We do, uh, we've evolved from product design towards uh, uh, furniture design and uh, interior design and sometimes architectural design. Uh, this is a commission for the Dutch Railways and I wanted to make a sort of neighborhood of furniture in which people would sort of really interact in different ways. Uh, so I really like these pictures actually of the furniture in use and because uh, it's a very open space, there's a lot of traffic and how do you create different levels of intimacy or of interaction between people using very basic shapes. Uh, this is the economy department of, uh, of a school um, and uh, yeah, this was a really nice commission because usually schools are really uh, the interior design is very functional, has less, uh, not very much uh, connection with the subjects that are given. And we really wanted to make the reception of this uh, department, which is the economy department, very uh, uh, close, to, close to, the, to the subject. Um, so this is, for example, the gathering room, which uh, has, a, has a reference to a factory. Uh, but it's also sort of something between furniture space, uh, it's a metaphor. Uh, on different levels it works and we did that with all the sort of big subjects in the economy this is transportation so it's a stack of crates or leisure this is a, a stadium where we actually put the table football and suddenly this this sort of table football thing became a, a real social place uh, ice cold is a project for Heineke um, and here we are very much uh, uh, working for the marketing department of a big brand and uh, you know we, they have their requirements and and the the the, the, the approach is less radical it's uh, more in, in service of a brand uh, but I try to put in the sort of quality that I find important uh, the the layering the uh, sense of improvisation this is Children growing up. This was a very nice commission to make a restaurant for a, a child-friendly restaurant. And actually, uh, what our observation was is that the two worlds are often separated. You have the restaurant for the grown-ups, and then the kids go and play somewhere in, in some devices that are especially made for them. Uh, in this case, we really wanted to integrate the two worlds to make a magical restaurant, a magical place um, where both. Uh, grown-ups and children would feel comfortable. So we mixed sort of very classical elements with very uh, playful elements um, and sort of, yeah, really integrated those two things. And the last project I'd like to show you is a, a restaurant in, in Rotterdam called uh, Fabrica Factory in, in Italian. It's an Italian restaurant and um, uh, here we use the metaphor of a very romantic uh, canteen of a factory, of a factory that, where the product is actually the pleasure of the guests. And um, the client gave us a lot of liberty. For example, we were able to really make canteen tables, very long tables, where the guests would actually uh, get together in a, a, and interact as, as a, a sort of random way in the way they would be arranged. Uh, we tried to combine a very sort of uh, industrial and stu sturdy aesthetics with but then at the same time use very fresh, uh, light, co uh, colorful uh, uh, color palette. Uh, and finally we made this oven. Uh, everything is specially made and that's the, the sort of reflex I have as an industrial designer. And when I go into an interior designer, I, I really want to design all the objects as well. So the oven is the absolute sort of center point and uh, it's also specially made for this place. And the wood is really functional in the sense that it's used for the oven. Uh, and I would like to finish right here and actually uh, say um, that it was a really incredible conference and uh, uh, we're facing incredible times and uh, we've been talking about massive change uh, and I think there is need for massive change and I hope that we designers can sort of make sure the massive change is done in a humane way uh, and that's how I would like to conclude. Thank you.